So good morning, DevOx, and uh, welcome to this talk called Vaporware. And this talk is about the stories about uh, all those software products that were announced, big announcements, and then it never came to happen. But what if? What if you all woke up really early this morning and came here for a talk and there was nothing? Would be a bit of a bummer, wouldn't it? And so the Many times we call those things that are announced and then nothing, just slideware. And if there's one thing we've got, it's slides. Could I get the sound on? And we got sound as well. So, welcome. And I'm really glad to see you all here so early in the morning for a talk about nothing. <laughs> and this talk starts out in the mountains of Canada. Beautiful, isn't it? So this is where the Microsoft Windows product teams used to go for their strategy meetings. And uh, you have two mountains here in British Columbia. One of them is the Whistler Mountain, the other one is the Blackcomb Mountain. Now, uh, for those of you who are really interested in Windows might know that Windows Whistler was the code name for Windows XP. Windows Blackcomb was the code name for Windows 7. And in, so Whistler, Blackcomb, two of the big sort of Windows versions that were. But in between these two mountains, where the ski slopes coming down from each and one of them, there is an APRIS ski place, which is where the Windows product team sat down and planned sort of the small interim release of Windows that was to be released between these two big major versions. And that the place they went to was the Longhorn Saloon and Grill. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the story of the long lost Windows Longhorn. So the Microsoft product team decided to name their product after a bar they went out binge drinking on. This could not be a story with a good ending, but it's an interesting story with loads of things going on underway. So, this is the actual prototype that Microsoft had internally for their Windows Longhorn project. So they were so keen on this project that they actually announced that they had a new version of Windows in the makings even before they released Windows XP. So this is Microsoft's own prototype of Windows Longhorn. Only thing though is that this was not built with any Microsoft technologies. This was made with something called Macromedia Flash. <laughs> and I must say that the UX team at Microsoft are very good with Flash, because I can't remember seeing any Flash websites that look like this. So, but still, the Longhorn project were built on many new in innovations at Microsoft. They had something called Microsoft Avalon, which was their project to create the new UI with sort of see-through windows and using all of the new graphics acceleration technology that was out there at the time. Uh, they had a new communication framework, Microsoft Indigo, that was there to, to integrate web services, so the entire WS star stack into Windows. And the reason for that was to get this sidebar thing on the side, because Bill Gates had one big dream, and that was a project he called Microsoft Hailstorm. That would be services delivered by every, everyone and everything around the world to integrate into Windows. And of course, you need the entire WS star stack with security and messaging and everything to get the weather forecast in there. So um, in addition, they also had the WinFS file system, another big dream of Bill Gates's. 
He wanted to build a file system built upon the Microsoft SQL Server um, database so that you could get these nifty search features that you are seeing here with sort of context and everything. Uh, never mind that Google actually had solved sort of indexing for the entire web a few years earlier. They wanted to use uh, Microsoft SQL Server in this. It was a very crazy project and it had loads of leaks and it built up sort of a big uh, anticipation within the developer community and also within the business community. And I think we have some video footage from the actual Longhorn Saloon when they were planning this. Oh, this could make a grown man cry, as Mick Jagger says in there. Oh my god, <laughs> this is the people behind the idea of Windows Longhorn. It's crazy. But let's look at a bit more of Windows Longhorn, because I guess that quite a few of you in the room are making business software uh, in your day j jobs, right? Uh, am I right? Yeah, because otherwise this wouldn't be rele very relevant. So this was sort of a part of a bigger vision. And uh, this wonderful little promotional video was another internal Microsoft video uh, to tell the story of the great software we could build for our clients on the Windows Longhorn operating system. Uh, and it's a kind, of, a kind of a bleak story. It, it, it says that software these days aren't good at all, but it's going to be way better in the future. So the idea was that with all of these new services, we could build really nice enterprise software. And having things like Microsoft Indigo in there with the web service stack, we could at least do enterprise software. Uh, uh, but the thing was, and here's where this story gets funny, is that they were building all of these things on the recently introduced Microsoft.NET stack. And uh, that's actually what caused all of the problems because the Microsoft.NET stack was not mature at all at this time. And uh, they had loads of issues integrating this into uh, to Windows. So after four years in development, they sort of suddenly pulled the plug on the entire project and did what is known internally at Microsoft as the big reset. So they just went back to an earlier branch of the operating system and started all over again. And uh, there was one rule introduced at that time, and that was that absolutely no Microsoft.NET code is allowed in the Windows code base whatsoever. Everything needs to be written in C++. And uh, that happened. They went on, and uh, this eventually arose as Windows Vista, but Windows Longhorn never happened. And just in case anyone is thinking that maybe this is some kind of uh, prototype or something, let's uh, run a, a classic application. Uh, anyone remember VisiCalc? So VisiCalc, that was one of the softwares that Microsoft at the PDC conference in 2003 decided to run on Windows Longhorn to sort of show what it was capable of. This is WYSIWYG. There have been two real explosions that have propelled the industry forward. The first one uh, really happened in 1977, and it was the spreadsheet. I remember when uh, Dan Feilstra, who ran the company that marketed the first spreadsheet, walked into my office at Apple one day and pulled out this disk from his uh, vest pocket and said, I, I have this incredible new program. I call it a visual calculator, and it became VisiCalc. And that's what really drove, propelled the Apple II to, to the success it, it achieved. So VisiCalc, which is what was the predecessor to things that we use today like Excel, and other kinds of business software were big at the begin turn of sort of 
19, end of 1970s, early 1980s. And uh, there were loads of things going on. You had uh, things like WordPerfect, WordStar, Lotus 1, 2, 3. Uh, but th these were always different sort of softwares for different use cases. Enter Ovation Technologies. Ovation Technologies introduced a office suite that was fully integrated, which meant that you didn't need to have different applications to do your word processing, to do your spreadsheets, to do your database management, to do for your communication needs and so forth. You could have it all in one software product. And um, this got loads of press coverage. This is just one of the many industry magazines covering this. Uh, and hailing it for, for the supreme user experience that this would bring. This is the user experience. But you can see that you have like pie charts in with texts. Uh, and uh, this was sort of revolutionary uh, at the time, because no one else was, uh, was doing this. So they got loads of VC money in there. Um, and... Uh, then sort of things started to happen, because this software had been announced. But then John Gantz, who was a journalist at uh, Tech Street Journal, started to question if this product was real or not. Uh, now, all of the press coverage that had been up to that point had been based on uh, prototypes that had been showcased on many trade shows. So uh, imagine someone down in the expo area showing you the Ovation software. The only thing, though, was that it was running, not running on a computer, it was running on a VHS video cassette, uh, which maybe could get people asking questions. And then suddenly, uh, Ro Robert Kutnick, who was the director of development at um, Ovation, goes into this sort of a public discussion with the CTO of the company and uh, criticizing the feature requirements for this one. Uh, because there was one important requirement that had been marketed very well, and that was that this product would have a spreadsheet with 7 million cells. Wherever that number comes from, I have no idea, but Lotus123, which was the market-leading spreadsheet, uh, at this time was capable of having a, a little over 2 million cells. So I guess that 7 million cells is at least three times as good, and in, if not, even more. Uh, the problem that uh, John Robert Kutnick talks about in this interview is that they did not have the technology to do any of these things. Um, and uh, then suddenly we come to people start talking about the concept of vaporware. And vaporware was a word that had been floating around in Silicon Valley for a while, but the story of Ovation Technologies was the first sort of big one to, to be described as vaporware, and hence this article, Developers Unveil Vaporware. Now, Ovation Technologies never happened. Robert Kutnick went on to form another company where he brought loads of the ideas from this project with him, but uh, this never happened. So this was sort of the poster child of this. Now, the word vaporware was introduced by these uh, two lovely women. Uh, we have Anne Winball. She's best known for being Bill Gates' ex-girlfriend. And they, uh, they had a very special relationship. Uh, even after Bill Gates married Melinda, uh, Bill and Anne used to go on vacations together every single year, uh, and they kept uh, they kept on doing that for uh, for quite a while. So she has had a major influence on uh, on Bill Gates. The other one is Esther Dyson, who was uh, one of the very very early venture capitalists in the IT business, and she ran a um, a newsletter which was this, the release newsletter. And uh, in this one, uh, it's she talked about vaporware. So this is the very first time the word is used. Now, the word was coined by Anne Winbold, and Anne Winbold met Esther Dyson at a conference, and they talked about this the phenomenon. And uh, a year later, or later the same year, this was published. And in this one, uh, there are a few products that are described as vaporware in there. One is Foxbase, 
that actually became a proper product. It was later what became a Microsoft Fox Pro. Um, so uh, sometimes it might be that it's actually worth the wait, waiting for software to be released, even if we think it will not be released. And speaking of software that people have been waiting for, uh, anyone played this game? This is Duke Nukem from uh, 1991. Uh, it was developed by Apogee Software. Uh, it had quite a few of innovations in there. John Carmack, who would later be famous for creating Doom, helped out on some of the techniques used behind the scenes here. Uh, so this was a uh, interesting game. A follow-up came a couple of years later, but the important follow-up was the 1996 Duke Nukem 3D. This was sort of a groundbreaking first-person shooter game. Uh, and uh, it had your typical 1990s action hero, and the plot of it was that, that strong man going around saving strippers from uh, alien invaders. Uh, it had that proper, inappropriate, raunchy theme to it, that probably went well with many teenage boys uh, at the time, and this be became a hugely popular game. The thing is, uh, if you have a hugely popular game, you're also expected to have a huge follow-up. And let me tell you, Apogee didn't uh, set the bar low for this one. So this is the trailer for a game that they set out to build called Duke Nukem Forever. And some of you probably heard the story of Duke Nukem Forever. They settled for nothing less than perfection. And uh, for that reason, uh, they had their own 3D engine that was built for a very similar game called Prey that was set to be released in uh, 1998. Uh, but for this one, they decided to use the Quake engine instead because a game that was even superior to their own game had been released, and that was named Quake. Decided we want to use the 3D engine from this one because we want nothing but the best. Year later, another press release comes out. Another game has uh, come on the market. That game was named Unreal. It was an even better first-person shooter than Quake. So we use the Unreal Engine for this one, because we want nothing but perfection for, for our game, so we want to use this. And then things just keep on going. Um, a few years later, um, the uh, distribution company is, is sold, but the developers still have the intellectual property rights, and they have loads of money, so they can keep on going developing this. Come 2001, and Duke Nukem is 10 years old. So retelling the entire story of uh, Duke Nukem throughout the years, there is still no game, but they still keep on doing this. And the thing is, we have loads of money. So we keep on developing the game. And as time goes by, this sort of gets into a uh, big discussion around what is happening with Duke Nukem. It even makes the front page of CNN. And uh, there is this big fight going on between the developers and the, uh, and the uh, publisher. The publisher buys yet another game, Max Payne, from the developers, giving them even more money to keep on building this perfect game that will be the best game ever. They even put in this little teaser trailer at the end to tell the uh, publisher it will be released when it's done. Then suddenly something interesting happens, because everyone had forgot about this. Uh, the Penny Arcade Expo in 2010 announces that you can come, if you, you're 17 years or, or older, because this is a very naughty game, you can come to their booth in the expo area and actually get to play the game. And this is the queue. This is the queue for, for that. It was, went on forever and ever. And come May 24th, 2011, Duke Nukem Forever is actually released. 
So the ga uh, game came out. It still, until this day, holds the Guinness Book of Records uh, record for the longest game ever in development. It is 14 years and 44 days to build this. The reception was less than stellar, I can tell you. Um, uh, some of the reviews saying that the only good thing about this was that it finally was released. Uh, another uh, magazine gave it once in a lifetime, minus 1,000 score. So uh, this game was not the uh, Duke Nukem the set out to build. This was just something that they had to put out there to put an end to a never-ending story of this. And that is why Duke Nukem is vaporware, even if it was released. So uh, it's not that long till Christmas. Anyone started doing any Christmas shopping yet? Started thinking about it? If you are in uh, need of ideas for Christmas presents, I can recommend uh, Neiman Marcus, uh, which is a uh, department store chain in the southern states in the US. They have this beautiful Christmas book that they release every single year. This is the 1969 edition of the Neiman Marcus uh, Christmas book. And in their Christmas books, they had sort of loads of interesting products that you could go out and buy. Uh, in 1969, they had a concept of gifts that keep on growing. You could buy a baby elephant, that's a slow-growing present, or you could buy a plant that grows really rapidly. This sort of goes in with all of the other interesting uh, Christmas gifts that they had. Uh, you had a his and her set of camels. You can get a, a colonial-style chicken coop. You could get a mermaid suit with included mermaid swimming lessons, or you could get a rose gold private jet. But I think the most interesting one they ever had was this one in their 1969 book. Uh, this is the Honeywell Kitchen Computer with the tagline, if she only can cook as well as Honeywell can compute. This was 1969, so uh, gender equality and that wasn't where we have it today. Uh, so the Honeywell Kitchen Computer uh, cost a little over uh, $10,600 which at that time probably would buy you a nice suburban home in the areas where Neiman Marcus had their department stores. But with, uh, with that money, you also got a two-week programming course included. Uh, because the Honeywell Kitchen computer didn't come with any software, uh, but it was uh, kitchen-sized, so it sort of lived up to its name. Uh, th this is the actual uh, computer, but let's look at this film from two years earlier, where the Honeywell Kitchen computer plays a very important role. So... Uh, this is the Billion Dollar Brain from 1967. General Midwinter, priority. Okay, I'll take it. No, no, I'll handle it. So the Billion Dollar Brain starring Michael Caine and the Honeywell H200 computer. And um, this is actually some of the best documentation of how to operate this Honeywell computer uh, that ever existed. Um, so you would have like tape machines in there, you would have sort of loads of things that you had to put punch cards into as we see them doing now, and uh, loads of buttons to press, and buttons that are always cool. So there was only one Honeywell kitchen computer ever built. It was uh, never sold, but you can go to the Computer History Museum in the United States and see it there. Uh, it looks kind of cool. And this sort of brings us into a nice little sidetrack uh, here uh, about vaporware computers, computers that were never re released. And you might not think of IBM as a very design-savvy company, uh, but in uh, 1981, Paul Rand did this one, the iconic IBM uh, Rebus uh, graphical profile for, uh, for IBM. This is actually part of the permanent collection at the Museum of Modern Art in uh, New York. So this one is uh, really important. And uh, this one is the IBM Yellowbird computer from uh, 1976, the year I was born. Uh, Tom Hardy at uh, IBM uh, designed this computer. Uh, it was intended as a home computer, which was uh, nothing that IBM uh, did. 
at the time, but it's it's a fairly decent computer. It's, it has that bright yellow color in, inspired by Tweety Bird from uh, from the cartoons. And it has a keyboard, it has this little printer over on the left-hand side so you can print things. And it was meant to have cartridges that you could put in. Uh, this was only a design prototype. That's Tom Hardy's daughter using it. It could be hooked up to a television set. And this was pr presented to the board of directors at IBM, who were really skeptical towards this because IBM did not do things for the consumer market. So, uh, so this computer never got built. Tom Hardy is not a man who is easily stopped. So uh, the year later, uh, the IBM Aquarius is designed, also by Tom Hardy. But this time, he actually gets the IBM engin hardware engineers onto his team, and uh, they actually build this as a working computer. So you would have this lovely deep red uh, machine, and the color is not random. This was meant to sort of look like the IBM typewriters that could be found in many American homes at, uh, uh, at the, the time. And you would have cartridges that you could pu put in something called programming packs with different kinds of software. And you also had this touch-sensitive pad where you would slide in context-sensitive menus. So the right-click menu on the right-hand side of your computer, basically. This also had a very innovative style of memory, something called BEM bubble memory, which was permanent storage, so it wouldn't need any disk drives or hard disks or and tapes or anything to store things. You would have something similar to our solid state memory these days. Uh, again, presented to the IBM board of directors. Um, the year before the Apple I motherboard kit had been released, uh, the uh, Commodore PET 2001 was released at this time. So very early on in the home computing uh, story, th this one. IBM board of directors, very skeptical towards this one. Uh, again, because IBM did not do home computers, and uh, the only ever built of the IBM Aquarius was this prototype from uh, 1977. The designers at IBM are not easily stopped. Uh, in uh, 2001, something interesting happened. Uh, and the 2001, uh, sorry, 2001, I'm so talking 1992 people, um, was the year that the face had Tim, uh, Kate Moss on uh, the front page for the first ever time. Same month, the internationally renowned design magazine ID had a front page with Can Design Save IBM. And uh, the computer there uh, is the IBM Leapfrog tablet, designed and built in 1992 also part of the MoMA permanent uh, industrial design uh, collection, but never released. But it is a beautiful full machine, and just think what we could have had. Instead, IBM decided to build WebSphere, and that is probably part of the reason why many of people are, of you are here tonight. So, um, so something came out of it. Anyone ha ever had a Microsoft Soon MP3 player? Ah, one, two people in the room. They looked good, though. I had the iPad myself, uh, and uh, this was before streaming services, and uh, so you had to download music onto them. And I'm now going to tell you the story about Q-Tracks, which was a streaming service that was released, uh, or announced at least, in uh, 2008. This is from their big release party at the Medium uh, Music Industry Festival in uh, Cannes. Uh, and they had James Blunt in to give them a private concert. This is the actual footage from uh, within James Blunt's yeah. grand piano. So it's filmed from within the piano, so the quality isn't all that good. But they spent loads of money, millions of dollars, on a release party for this service that had not yet been built. They had something, and uh, it looked like this. Uh, again, this was built with Microsoft Silverlight, so it's very, very slow. Uh, Microsoft Silverlight what, what was what came out of that Microsoft Avalon project that was part of the Longhorn uh, story earlier on. So you had this interface. You could uh, go around, browse for music, search for things, and then uh, download them onto your computer 
which is all well and good until you started discovering what you could actually find there. Um, these are some interesting uh, recordings. Uh, anyone have these in their collections? Probably not, because these are bootleg uh, recordings that were never on official sale. You have things like Rolling Stones ultra rare tracks, Bruce Springsteen ultra rare tracks, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, you could not buy these uh, in uh, any record stores, uh, but where you could find these were on the peer-to-peer -peer music pirating networks. And that's the thing. That was what Qtrax actually was. It was built on top of the LimeWire <laughs> the LimeWire music pirating peer-to-peer um, -peer network, and they just downloaded things from there, slapped on some uh, DRM, and, uh, and then made it available for download. Now, the thing is that you, to do something like creating a, a, a streaming service, you actually need to have agreements in place with the right holders to the music, uh, which was the one thing missing from what Qtrax were building. Uh, so they sort of never got a proper release of this thing. Uh, in October 2008, a small Swedish company called Spotify launched uh, their service, and uh, that was the end of this one. So, CDs. If anyone has ever wondered how CDs are manufactured, this is a CD, CD manufacturing plant. And it looks fancy, it looks very automated, and it also looks very expensive. So uh, what if we could have some, uh, some uh, cheaper means of storing information than these sort of uh, aluminum and plastic disks? S that was a bright idea that someone came up with within the research community in India uh, in uh, the early noughties. And in the International Journal of Technology and Engineering Studies, a academic article was uh, published about rainbow technology. Now, I'm not entirely sure if this article s stands up to sort of the uh, rigorous academic quality requirements for, for a paper, but still, it's a, it's a fun read, and it's, it's even got Spider-Man in there. Um, but it explains a technology uh, with proper architectural diagrams of how this works, of storing information on paper. And what they say is that once the rainbow technology is in, we could be watching full-length high-definition videos from a piece of paper. Now imagine that, just the engineer back there putting a piece of paper into the projector and you can see a film here. That would be pretty amazing. So, so that's an awesome technology. Uh, but but l let's just do the back of the envelope of that. So let's say we have a piece of A4 paper, which is what we usually use here in Europe, that is 210 by 297 millimeters big. Uh, and on this, they were supposed to store 450 gigabytes of data. Uh, okay, let's be generous. Let's say that we have a really, really good quality scanner that is uh, 1,200 dots per inch. Uh, translating this into American numbers, that would be uh, about uh, 134 million dots on a piece of paper. That's decent. And let's also say that uh, this uh, scanner and the printer we have is able to have 256 different colors per, uh, per dot. That's generous. That would give us one byte per dot or 134 megabytes per page. And that's the best case scenario if we print this full bleed. Now, uh, so uh, Rainbow Technologies uh, mentions in this paper that they would use something like triangles and circles and things on the paper to compensate for errors and, uh, and things like that. Uh, there was never shown a uh, working prototype of this at all. Uh, but I, from the paper, it looks something like this. And uh, this reminds me of... Uh, a thing that was really popular in the 1990s, sort of magic dot pictures. Ever, anyone ever seen those? You would like stare at them for ages and something would pop out. So stare at this thing and... Because uh, <laughs> that's what this was. Uh, but let me introduce to you to a very interesting character. Uh, this gentleman right here is uh, Ted Nelson. 
Ted Nelson is, uh, is one of the pioneers within hacker culture. Uh, his story is not that often told, uh, but I think if it wasn't for Ted Nelson, uh, we wouldn't have uh, the computer culture we have today. And uh, Ted Nelson uh, had a self-published book that he produced entirely himself in 1974 called Computer Lib, Computer Liberation. This was uh, the entire, his dream for hacker culture and what, uh, what computers could come to be. This was released at the same time as the Altair uh, home computer was released, the very, very first home computer ever. So this was really on. The, bo uh, the book looks like this. It's all sort of hand-drawn, uh, typewriter written, and cut and paste together, everything done by Ted Nelson. It, explains basic computer science uh, principles in layman's terms, because this was a book written for every, everyone. He even has a bit of that that made uh, Duke Nukem Forever uh, popular with teenage boys in there. Um, so this was a revolutionary book, and it was actually re released uh, in uh, 1985 by Microsoft Press as a uh, proper bound volume. But I think the interesting thing with this one is that on the flip side of this book, you will find another one. So if you turn it around, you have Dream Machines, which is Ted Nelson's vision for a, um, a product that he wanted to build. So uh, let me welcome you to uh, Sanadu and the adventures of uh, Ted Nelson. So Ted Nelson's Sanadu project was a project that he started in the early 60s. It took his name from the great poem, the Kubla Khan. And in that poem, Sanadu is the great castle uh, in, uh, in the end of it all. So the, the Sanadu project was a vision that Ted Nelson had, and he envisioned that you would have something he called Sanadu stands, which would be places you could go and uh, experience a technology that he had uh, invented uh, in the early 60s called hypertext. So this would be a place where you could come and consume different types of digital media through a network of different Sanadu places. He envisioned that this would be sort of mom and pop shops that were run by local families just as a diner was. And you would come in here with your friends, sit down at a terminal and have access to the, a library of the entire world's knowledge. You can also write things and contribute to that library. And when you were driving along the highway with your family, you would see signs on the roadside saying that over two million screen hours of Xanadu served. And you could take off, go in, in there. The kids would go over to a terminal, maybe play a game on one of the machines while the parents waited to get one of the bigger sort of horizontal uh, CRT screens and where they could look at their vacation photos and reminisce over, um, over good memories uh, they had. So a very social place to consume media digitally. This is Ted Nelson himself with one of his models for, that he built for many of these Sanadu stands that he envisioned that he would be building around the United States. And uh, throughout the 60s, he built this all himself. Uh, in the 1970s, he met uh, the Resistors, uh, which we see some of them here. That stood for radically empathic students interested in science, technology, and other research studies. <sighs> That's a bit of a tongue twister. Um, but uh, these were all at the Princeton Computer Club. The average age of the members of that club were, was 15. The girl in the front there is Lauren Zarno. 
She was 14 at the time uh, she met Ted Nelson. She became his personal assistant, and 46 year years later, they actually married. So um, it took its time. But I think they uh, developed a long relationship over time. Uh, so these kids were developing this in the 1970s. In the 1980s, they built a more professional company around this. Um, so uh, around uh, uh, 1987, he had this team, uh, consisting of Roger uh, Gregory, who was second in command. His title was system anarchist. And that says something about what kind of guy Ted Nelson was. Uh, Phil Salin was the accelerator, uh, Mark Miller was the hacker, and there was also a woman called Gail, Gail Pergamet who was, had the title Hidden Variable. That's why she's not in Destroying. <laughs> so uh, John Walker, who founded Autodesk, had struck gold with his uh, 3D modeling software uh, around this time, and uh, he really believed in Ted Nelson and his Sanadu project. So uh, Autodesk uh, bought Sanadu and uh, started supporting the development of it. And John Walker said in 1998 uh, that Sanadu was a uh, dream in a single mine in uh, the 1960s. In 1980, it was the shared gold of a, a small group of brilliant technologists. By 1989, it will be a product, and by 1995, it will begin to change the world. 1995. And the world has changed. Uh, in 1992, uh, Tim Berners-Lee unveiled the World Wide Web, built on hypertext, the concept that Ted Nelson uh, invented and coined the term for. And uh, Mark Andresen had built the Mosaic browser, which was the first sort of popular, uh, widely available browser. And the rest of that is sort of history. But it didn't stop Ted Nelson. Well, so okay. What what we're trying to do with Project Xanadu is create a world so startling that most people, we have something called Xanadu shock, okay? And every one of us has gone through three or four levels of Xanadu shock, and we don't know how many levels there are of Xanadu shock as you realize what we're creating. And we, we continue, you know, we continually go through it ourselves. Basically, we, we've discovered what is what has to be the right and fundamental design for the library of the future. A system which is, has both a rational form of storage that is not elsewhere available in computer room, and a way of linking them all together so that anything published on any one computer anywhere in the world or in space can be accessed instantly. Less speed of light considerations, less disk queuing, less a few things like that, uh, so that essentially, within seconds, you will have access to anything that is written and published. It's very different from people in the video disk world, for example. If you're in the video disk world, somebody's got to have the video disk right there in the room. What good is that? I don't want a subset. No subset will do. And that's the whole point. If you can't have it all, look somewhere else. And, and, and the point of Xanadu is that as we get this ever-expanding library with millions of people online simultaneously, they will all be able to publish simultaneously, add things, annotate, make links, and we hope live in a freer environment than we live in now. Now, there's some big political issues here. And that's also going to be in my next book, Coffee Told Me Now. Thanks very much. So Appreciate this that. was Ted Nelson uh, in 1981 uh, talking about the vision of the product he was building. He is actually still building it. He is 85 years old now, but he still has the dream of this Sanadu, the perfect web being built. Now, this is an interesting project, uh, product. This is uh, Nerd Perfect. Uh, ner uh, released in 1987 by Vaporsoft, and uh, it was a booklet, and it came with a floppy disk. Now, f for those of you who recognize a uh, floppy disk of this kind, you might see that there is something missing here. 
uh, the actual disk inside uh, is not there. Um, and uh, that, that was the, the thing, right? This was sort of a uh, product that was nothing. But it came with a booklet that was uh, fairly interesting. It, it was loads of stories, loads of bad jokes and things in there. Uh, it got plenty of good reviews in the press, and it was sort of described as uh, the finally someone releasing some good old honest software. Uh, what it says on the box that is exactly what you get, nothing. Uh, it even was uh, described as the high-tech pet rock of uh, 1987 by a local uh, newspaper. And the pet rock was something uh, that was popular at the time that the kitchen computer was sold. It was an actual stone that you could buy and people bought over a million of them. Uh, so uh, so that, that's an interesting story, it's sort of a joke as well. Um, and uh, that makes me think that we, we can laugh at these stories. Uh, it's, it's easy to do that. But we need these kinds of people who dare to dream big and have big visions for what they want to build and actually have the guts to go out there and try to build it as well because that's what brings the world forward. And some of these great people who have failed big with their vaporware projects have had really good ideas. And some of them have even invested their entire lives into bringing that idea uh, to become reality. And I think we should be thankful that we have these kinds of people uh, because they are important. And uh, with that, I'll leave you it's been with the words lonely, of Ted Nelson. But I've been absolutely sure of what I've been doing all the time. So one of the main definitions of paranoia is believing what nobody else believes. So one cure is for the patient to change his mind and believe what the rest of the world believes. That is the low road. The other by which I hope to cure myself is to persuade everybody else. And then I will no longer be paranoid, but recognized as having been right all along. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This has been Vaporware, the best software that you never got to use. I'm Anders Noros. Thank you for coming this early in the morning and filling up the room. It has been really great speaking for you. Uh, have a great few talks of the reminder of the conference, and thank you for having me. Bye.